ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I keep saying that. It's, it's, it's Susie Orbach being here and makes me want to say ladies and gentlemen for some reason. Just welcome, all of you, regardless of uh, what gender you are. Um, to Floyd Museum's event, I'm really delighted to, um, to welcome Susan Hiller, who needs no introduction to you, I know, and Susie Orbach, who has really brought a, a Tremendous uh, discussion between the two of them. Um, there's just a couple of housekeeping things. This is actually, because the event we uh, saw that, we're live streaming this event tonight. And yeah, just remind you please to switch off any mobiles, mobile phones. You have. We actually have to turn it off because it's, it, it's not just those silence, it's like public. <laughs> Susan Susan has had a long association with the Freud Museum and I, I really find that her piece that's included in the Mad Bad Sad exhibition, which is uh, currently in Freud's study. It's actually been one of the most popular pieces in the entire show. And I can understand that it speaks to us, I think, in a very deep way and it kind of connects with Freud in a way that um, it, it's, it's visceral almost, this, the sound of it, it reaches us to, uh, to our ears, to our heads. I look forward to Susan talking more about her work, um, which stretches over decades and has influenced many of the finest artists of this generation as well. So, Susan, thank you for joining us tonight. And I see about thank you also for joining us in the conversation. Two Susans, thank you. Thank you. Um, Susan's a really important artist. And um, like all people who are incredibly accomplished. Can anybody hear me at the back? Yeah. Um, it's really hard for me to categorize her and categorize her work. I first came across Susan when she was on a TV documentary made by Gina Newsom called The Dinner Party with Marina Warner. Oh my God, these are so fiercely intelligent women. And they're so engaging. And it woke me up out of my somnolence, and I thought, oh my God, she's an artist too. Because she has a PhD in anthropology, right, as a background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to see her work, or I went to see some of it, mm -hmm. and I was incredibly delighted and engaged by it, and I suppose that's the word. And challenge, but those 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 are feelings that have always um, hit me with my work. I'll talk about the work in a second, just to kind of, in case you don't know how important she is. She's had retrospectives at the Tate in 2011, at the Baltic in Newcastle, and at Tate with Paul. Probably some other places too. Other, in other countries. As Dawn, our acting director, said, she's been very crucial in the Freud Museum because she did the most wonderful piece after the Freud Museum. I'm sure I don't have the title right. After a visit? Well, the, the installation here yes. was called After the Freud Museum. Yes. And then I did a book called After the Freud Museum. Right, but the installation then went to the tape, right? Yes, well, it traveled up. And what it's called from the from the museum. <laughs> <laughs> it's an extraordinary piece. Where is it now? Is it in the Tate's vaults or something? Yeah. I need to kind of petition them to get it out because it's a really extraordinary piece. And uh, she was very, very generous in allowing the uh, former director Erica Davies to take a piece, a little piece of it, and make a, a poster from it, a very high, um, high well, she took the cowboy. Yeah. yeah, and it's very, very beautiful. 
And it's, it kind of goes both ways. I mean, it, 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 you get one connection and then another connection and another connection. And it's really, she does things with it that are really worth trying to understand. I'd like to talk to her about it, but we don't have the piece here. The thing that I was thinking about when I was um, wondering what I might say about Susan is she's worked in every possible medium. Like you've got sound, you've got film, you've got um, photographs, you've got Punch and Judy. Yes, but that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so I think that, I don't know whether that's longevity or it's just the capacity to think I can work in all these different mediums or all these different mediums are what I need this, in order to express this. And what's interesting for me looking at back at the list of her works is how many of them have, I mean, how few I've seen, that's number one, because she's produced so much. But how many of them have stayed with me, even though I might not have gotten them at the time. They kind of haunt you and they disturb you. So, and they've become rather monumental to me. So I don't know whether it's called 10 months or 40 weeks. 10 months which is about pregnancy. And I imagine that, in my mind, as absolutely enormous, these panels. Right? And I think that's very interesting, because I don't think it's just speaking to my distortion. I think it's speaking to how challenging the piece is, and how all of your pieces are very, very challenging. And I kind of didn't get on with Punch and Judy at the time, but I thought, God, she was so pressing in terms of those themes of violence and throwing out the baby, and, and even at the height of women's liberation, women's liberation I can guess it, so which is a bit appalling to say, but you know, it stayed with me at many, many levels. So, um, and when she works, she breaks form, is what I think. You don't just use the form. You, you know, you don't expect in the middle of Regent's Park to be having speaking trees. Right? Or you don't expect a soundscape long before there were soundscapes in the tape. So I, I think she's really a very exciting and continues to be a most wonderful artist. Now, how we're going to talk about the work, I don't know. Um, a piece that I'm lucky enough to have is part of something that I think must have interested you for a long time because you've come back to it. And as I as I can describe it, they're blow it's a blown up picture from a photo booth. And it's I think they start as the midnight self-portraits, but I could be wrong on that. It's different. Okay. And on it is this autonomic writing. Yeah. So I think I'm going to ask you whether that, the reason I'm interested, and I think I can dare to ask you about a piece that's so old, is that I just saw a picture of your Gertrude Stein. Mm -hmm. That means somebody's phone. I mean, it's a piece I would you know, love to look at properly. But I wanted to wanted to know your interest in it because it's obviously something you've come back to. Yes, because you've you come back to it. I thought I turned this off, you know, this is a anyway. I, I need to say first of all that it's very difficult to talk when someone's saying nice things, you know. But is that a conversation? So like Susie's books and you know, I feel this should reciprocal, but, okay, the particular piece you're describing, I think we should tell people that this was how we met, really. Was it your 40th birthday? And I, yeah. I, the only thing I wanted was having owned nothing of this, uh, and that, oh, art, I didn't even know you owned art, was a little piece of Susan Hiller. Well, you said to me, I mean, it was so extraordinary for me, because I hardly sold anything for years and years, and that this very distinguished person was coming to see me and was interested in this work. And you said, 
And it was incredibly endearing. You said, well, I think now that I'm 40, I'm grown up. <laughs> and, um, and, and I can have a piece of art if I want to. <laughs> and um, I thought that was lovely. So Susie actually has two panels from a piece, which is called, Sometimes I Think I'm a Verb Instead of a Pronoun. And um, when you said you saw I was still interested in these ideas, I thought you meant that, because the idea that the self is constantly um, in movement, if you like, which of course has become a thing that theory, it's, if you take any theory courses at art school or whatever, you'll learn all about this. I, I don't know. I got the idea from not. <laughs> He was a, the victorious general in the American Civil War, but also a rather unsuccessful president of the United States. But he wrote some wonderful, his diary is fantastic. He was a very thoughtful man, as well as an alcoholic, which is why he was a bad president. But one of the things he wrote in his last illness was that some, sometimes I think I'm a verb instead of a pronoun, a verb, and then he went on to say the things a verb could be. It expresses to be. And he said, I am, and therefore I'm a verb. It was just a very, I thought, a very wonderful idea. And in those images, in the photo booth machine, I turned my back to the camera, because I, this is why it's different from the portraits. It's yeah. a movement on from that, because I really decided that the whole idea of fixing your self-image or your image in a portrait is very strange, and it's particularly strange when you think of painting, because what a painter does when she or he makes a portrait of someone is to compress many, many, many different moments into one fixed image. And when you think about it, I mean, that's supposed to be realism. What's real about that? So anyway, this was part of my thinking around that work. But let me interrupt you for I want you to come back on that, because now that we've got such an incredible critique of what visual culture does with the fixed image and the reshaped image and photoshopping that every kid can do and you know parents do to their children, their babies, and you know, they insert dimples and God knows what. It's very interesting that how early on you turned away from that and said, you need to understand that this image is, is too fixed. Well, <clears throat> there this is we could talk about this for a long time. I mean, a good photograph or a good portrait, painted portrait, is said to capture something in the individual, which this may well be true, but whether it's real, really like the person is another, a completely separate issue. So anyway, I did a series of pictures of myself, photographed on the back, moving in different ways, and overlaid them with this automatic, so-called automatic writing that I've been interested in for a while. Uh, and you want to talk about that. Yeah, I want you to I talk about that interests anybody here, but... You know what? Whatever you say is either going to interest them or they'll think, why am I not interested in this? <laughs> I, I, I need to know about this. Well, all, because all, it, it's a stage of interest. You come back to it. You just go through all that writing piece. is, is in a way, parallel with hypnosis, is one of the subjects that psychoanalysis was very interested, interested in early on and then dropped, you know, because it's, it's paradoxical. Um, Automatic writing is a practice that really derives from the spiritualists and the mediumship of people who conveyed messages in writing that they said was dictated to them by another entity. And it's extremely interesting. My experience with automatic writing was not dictated to me by an entity, but just to, to tell you something very briefly, I was in France, I was working on a project, a postal art project, um, which was the first effort I ever made to explore this area of, if you like, what's real and what isn't, basically. So because I had become convinced as an artist that there was no such thing as one artist inventing something, and then a lot of followers, which is the story that art history tells us, 
I thought that ideas came to people at the same time. And I mean, there are a lot of historical examples of that. Darwin and what's his name? I don't know who I mean. I can't remember. Who was the other person? Yes, that's right. Um, and I knew this from art, mm -hmm. from seeing what was happening among artists. And suddenly, people would all be doing something. And they weren't influenced by each other. It was just happening in that particular way at that moment. So I designed a postal art project that was based on some experiments in telepathy that had been conducted. It all sounds so complicated. Anyway, what I did was I asked people uh, in different parts of the world at a certain time to pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and to try to think of an image to see if they would all be thinking of similar images and so forth. So that was, that was the project I was engaged in. One, uh, one of, the, uh, of the occasions when I was supposed to be engaged in this, my pencil just went on moving. And it was extremely peculiar because um, in complete dissociation, I mean, I was watching my hand you know, move across the paper, and it was writing in a bizarre handwriting that wasn't anything like my handwriting. And it, it got quite frantic. It was page after page after page of this stuff. And I always said afterwards that this is what precipitated me outside the bounds of pure conceptualism. Mm -hmm. Because conceptual art was, at the beginning, a question of dealing with what was already in language. And this experience was not in, it, it wasn't part of that kind way of thinking. And in fact, a footnote to that is that many of the women artists of the 60s and 70s who are subsequently being rediscovered also were outside the boundaries of conceptualism because they were dealing with personal issues. And that was also outside conceptualism. So anyway, that was my break. And I've been interested in, in automatism ever since. Now, the connection with Gertrude Stein has to do with a much more recent series that I'm doing, which is looking at uh, famous modernist artists. She's the only non-visual one. The others are all painters who <coughs> used techniques that, or ideas that derive from what was called the occult. Automatic writing being one of them, telepathy, etc., etc. And I've worked with um, material from, say, Duchamp, which led me to do a series of works on the human aura, because Duchamp did a very famous painting called Homage to Dr. de Michel, which is a painting of one of his best friends, surrounded by absolutely classic, um, yeah, auras. You can't call it anything else. And I wanted to demystify all of that in seeing and showing that it was the way that artists used these techniques, which was submerged in the way that they spoke about their work, nevertheless managed to carry those techniques on historically. So that today we still have knowledge of some of these ideas that might have been thought absolutely weird. But famous artists did stop with it. I mean, what's so interesting, I'm thinking from psychoanalysis yeah. point of view now, because I'm thinking about the pre-origins and mesmerism and sort of all of that, and I'm thinking that what, you, what, that, what that writing did, presumably, was to destabilize what yeah. the self, the yeah, notions exactly. of the self. Who was right? And, yeah. you know, you're, no not, you're not the master in your own house, well, so to speak. Yeah. So that, 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 and then it makes me think, when you talk about the orders, the, the big post-World War II uh, interest in the very strange, often wildcat feelings, and you want, if you want to, you can call them warrants, that the therapist has sitting with or reflecting or feeling about the patient or the person that they're working with, is that you get a kind of somatic uh, thing that doesn't fit in words. That's interesting. But you don't draw it out in color paint or anything. No, but I've been perplexed enough by it when very strange things have happened to me to go and, after the session, enact it and, and, and try it out to see what on earth that is. What, what, why am I getting 
Well, why am I getting a smell of burning? What's that about? It has nothing to be talked about in relation to that. Why do I feel enormous or tiny? Um, why am I sticking my tongue out involuntarily after a session? It's things that are some form of communication. Now, in, in my case, it, it, these things are happening to me um, outside of the clinical setting. Okay? <laughs> so they're, they're things that I can reflect on in relation to the work. In, in relation to the well, work. Well, that's like Freud. Yeah, of course. Because you know that he wrote about Absolutely. Freud. Absolutely. And possibly people who don't know about some of his early, early writings, mm -hmm. I think. Um, he wrote about telepathy and he wrote about transference as being a form of mind to mind connection. And he had case histories. Um, I remember the woman who he, I believe, even met, and she came with this dream that described his home. He just moved to the new flat or wherever the street was. And he, she described all the rooms, the kitchen, everything, and it was just fantastic that he's, he's written it up as though he took it as an actual truthful report. But he doesn't say anything about it in terms of its what level of reality this would be on. He simply wants to know why she was so interested in him that he, she had this dream. <laughs> <laughs> so the, he, he has recorded that and a number of other extremely um, interesting experiences without allowing them to slip into this category called the occult. He's just seeing this is him, this is human, this is what people are. And he says at one point that he would rather trust the, um, the curious superstitions of the common people than the, the sort of prosaic dismissal of them by scientists because he's willing to keep an open mind. And all of this is, of course, nowadays coming forward as something we need to think about because if physics can suggest that we live in seven different dimensions simultaneously then how can we refuse that invitation to well think maybe more? but maybe instead of thinking because of physics maybe thinking in terms of our own experience well, right that's what that's but i'm saying you trespass outside yeah but that, isn't that what your work does is it's kind of on those boundaries well, i hope so but I, you know, I used to call it paraconceptual. It's a combination of. Uh, okay, that's a step too far to go. Yes, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Because it was, it was hard to find a way to, to talk about it. But I think now that I've been looking at it, it seems to me that I have a perplexity, which, given that I'm not a psychoanalyst or involved in that field, but I still feel there's a separation between the mind and the brain, if you like. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> tell me, tell me more. Well, you know, I can go into that mode. You know, I've been very, <laughs> I've been very interested in dreaming and lucid dreaming. Yeah, I've got a lot of projects about dreaming, and there's a lot of research on so-called lucid dreaming um, from the '80s. Very convincing uh, experimental work done in under laboratory con conditions and so forth, but. Still, when we think about dreaming, we don't think about this idea of lucidity. Lucidity is when a person who's dreaming knows that they are dreaming. In other words, they become self-aware in the dream. And having done that, they can then manipulate uh, the conclusion of the dream, turn it into a happy ending, or go fly off somewhere. And this is very well known in other cultures, as it turns out. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism has a whole kind of yoga called uh, the dream yoga. And various Native American groups practice this and teach their children and so forth. Okay. Well, in lucid dreaming, if, if they set people a task, for example, and they might say to someone, okay, if you're a lucid dreamer tonight when you're asleep, go into the lucid dreaming mode and perform such and such a task. And people do things such as using Morse code to tap out the phrase, I am dreaming. Now, the brain waves that are being recorded show that they're in a dream situation. Mm -hmm. But they're, they are conscious and aware, which means they have something different than the brain. Otherwise, what would be the mechanism? Well, you could argue that there are different aspects going on in the mind. Right? Why would you want to call it brain? 
Well, because it's, that's the way they measure dreaming. They, not psychoanalysts, but scientists, measure dreaming by the, the, the activity. Yes, the brain activity. Well, you could, yeah, I agree, you could doubt that. There are many things, but it's just interesting to me. Um, One of the projects I know nothing about. Oh, you won't get away from that subject. No, <laughs> yes, not at all. I want to get, I want to ask you about a project that I haven't seen, which I wrote down, which I think is the psychic and the psychic dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know it's a project that you haven't seen. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah, so that's a project you haven't seen. Am I wrong in thinking that's about dreams? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting that you picked up on that. Side Girls is uh, <coughs> one of the video pieces I've done using uh, appropriated footage from films. And in this case, uh, showing girls who have uh, remarkable talents of uh, telekinesis. Telekinesis being moving things at a distance without touching them physically. And um, the girls range in age from one uh, sort of like nine-year-old to someone in her late teens, and they all, the little girl enjoys it in the field. The others are very troubled by this strange thing that happens that they can do. And I was really thinking in that and some other related film pieces about the way that um, these special powers that are often attributed to children are part of a long religious tradition. Mm -hmm that used to be attributed to saints, for example, in Catholicism. And now, when many people are secular and don't believe in that sort of thing, films and television are providing us with endless examples of this kind of stuff. So, you know, which I find extraordinary because there's more and more and more of it every year. And it seems to me that that must mean that there is some kind of desire or hunger to, I would say, know more about what this is, mm -hmm. or something. I think it's partially a fairy tale and partially has some roots in reality. And the films are simply, okay, I'll tell you, the films, the films show us the actual miracle. Let's call these events miracles. The films show us the miracle. In traditional um, practices, Catholicism being one, no, et cetera, et cetera. When these practices are represented, you don't see the miracle. You see the saint. Except in Catholicism, in the history of Catholicism, the Counter-Reformation, which was a big attempt to reassert Catholic belief, you suddenly get paintings that will have the saint in prayer and then the miracle tiny up in the sky. Before that, they only showed the saint. Mm -hmm. So now we have these miracles being shown to us all the time, which I think is strange. But is it miracle or is it the inexplicable? Well, it used to be called a miracle. Yeah. It, now it's the inexplicable. Yes, you're right. But what is the attraction? No, I don't, for me? Yeah. Oh, I'd love to see girls doing these wonderful things. But, mm -hmm. um, Really, that piece started for me as a, as a sort of critique of media. I designed it so that um, the soundtrack is very powerful. The soundtrack, and you know how the meaning of films is often carried on the sound. The soundtrack is a, a field recording of a gospel choir in the United States, and they're drumming and clapping and so forth. I mean, that kind of music is this incredible effect. You sort of feel it raising your blood pressure, and you know you want to do something, move, dance, clap, something. And so there's two minutes of that, and then there's followed by two minutes of silence. Now, when you look at these images with the music going, it's very different than looking at them with the scrutiny of a silent room behind you. Mm -hmm. So you fluctuate, I think, between two kinds of feelings about it, which is exactly where I am. So that piece was intended, in a sense, to sort of demonstrate the um, ambiguity of this whole area in terms of how we're meant to respond to it, or it might just be my own ambivalence about it. But I deliberately designed that piece so that no one could walk out of it saying, oh, Susan believes in telekinesis. They might go, 
well, for two minutes she believes in it, and then for another two minutes she's completely not believing in it. So that's, I think, where we're positioned as people. Do you not think that? Not in terms of telekinesis, but in terms of these ideas. That well, I, I think from my field, from yeah. my field, rather than from an artist trying to rent something. <laughs> I'm always struck by the paucity of language to describe the phenomena that occur either in my mind or my body during or after sessions because I, I, I carry things with me. And so we come up with these very clunky words to describe things. It doesn't actually mean anything. The words. The words, they're not, they're not sufficient because they're just groups like objective identification, counter-transference, um, transference. I mean, they're not, they're just not good enough, but they're the only thing we have, and inside of those we have to try to describe something that is quite difficult to describe, and for which we're lacking um, a sufficiently physical language. I mean, if I can use it that way. Um, but I don't, I don't know where to put it, but I, I just think but that you know it's, it happens because I know there's a there's something that is at, at the level of the transmission of communication and I'm being invited to feel, understand, be, be interested in something that doesn't quite sit ordinarily. I, 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 this is a really strange segue, but I now want to segue into something that I saw in New York by happenstance of Susan's. Yeah, when I actually came to a showing of your film, um, the, the languages that were going extinct, I, and it's a very important film, actually. And I suppose it speaks to both the cultural places where these kinds of ideas might have been accepted, but in, in global culture, you know, they're being wiped out, unless they're being expropriated for some kind of profit or something like that, right? But it was a very moving film because you use sound and the archive material of these languages and use very new words and print. And it was very, and I'd like to know how that project came out and why. I, I know I'm sort of around, but it's so that you can all come in and talk to Susan after I've done a whistle-stop, non-comprehensive tour of the things that have really affected me. I'm really glad you saw that. Um, that's fairly recent. Um, well, three or four years old. Yeah. But, you know. um, this, I keep the screen blank except for the subtitle, which it's called The Last Silent Movie, so I use the, the format of movies to have the subtitle at the bottom. The subtitle translates as best it can be translated. The spoken utterance of a person who speaks or spoke a language which is probably not there anymore. And so it's very <coughs> tragic. But it also points to one of the hauntings of film and radio and television is that we see dead people and hear dead people in the same way. We see representations of them in the same way live people. And I think it's particularly haunting with radio, with sound, with taping, because you get some idea. Because sound is very physical, because it touches your ear. So there's a physical contact between you and the voice of this dead person. Now, I, I, I find that worth considering. Yeah. And so in that film, you know, starting with that idea, I sort of raided the archives illegally, by the way. This, this, there were two, two things there. The people who collect these films, these languages, are very well-meaning, and there's a great deal online about all of this. And they <coughs> talk about, you know, the tragedy of the disappearance of the language, which is of course true, because every time we lose a language, you lose an entire worldview, and names for things and words for particular states of being, being that we don't have vocabulary for. So we're just depleting our own our own personal resources of being able to think well about things. Anyway, 
They talk about that, but they don't talk about what happened. Why did the, the people are gone? That's the point. <coughs> That's the point that I feel when I hear these voices and what happened to them. Well, many terrible things. So that made me annoyed. The fact that there was all this um, discussion about how sad it is when languages disappear. What well, is sad when the people disappear for goodness sake? Or when they lose their language because they're forced to move into cities and their communities break down and so forth and so on. Or they're killed off by an imported disease that they have no immunity for. Or there's thousands of reasons, all sad. And then the second sad thing was that not only are the languages dying, but then they're put into archives where they die a second death because you're not allowed to go to those archives. That's why I said I stole them. <laughs> no, seriously. You can't get permission. I couldn't get permission to, to go and record any of these uh, places at different universities and museums. No. So no. wait, let's see the process. What did you do? I'm not going to tell you. I stole them. <laughs> I stole them. Because I thought they should go out to the world instead of being kept in an archive at some obscure anthropology department. And when I say obscure, I mean that one of the oldest languages, the one that introduces all the rest by this wonderful South African um, man, his recording, which was made in 1933, was only found a couple of years ago on a wax disc thrown into a kind of junk heap at the back of a cupboard in a university that doesn't even exist anymore. And when clearing it out to make it into a new classroom for a different institution, they found this incredible artifact. So they're sort of doubly disappeared. <coughs> And um, do you think that aspect, I've got so many things to say, one bracket is that that idea of the lost languages and the stolen languages I've used in relation to what's happening to girls and women's bodies is that we're losing languages, are we losing bodies, as for the, the, the variety of bodies as fast as we're losing languages. And that that's one of the terrible things about um, global culture. But is, was the, I mean, the thing is, it's, it's, it's a film made by somebody who's an artist, so it's not a documentary, it's much better than, you know, it's fabulous, and it's completely engrossing. I think it's maybe two hours long, right? No? Well, but it's less than an hour, yeah. Actually, it's so engaging that you, you know, I think it's quite difficult to watch, you know, because of the blank screen, okay, what does that mean? Excuse me, it seems to me that it provides a place for projection. So the camera's not projecting, you know, the projector's not projecting any pictures, but you're listening to these people. And I believe that quite often people start to imagine the person who's speaking. And then, and that's ethical, isn't it? It's, it? You're creating a persona from the fact that these vibrations are touching the ear. I mean, it's all very curious. But I felt that to show pictures would be to diminish the power of the voices. Mm -hmm. um, the voices, each one unique. You know, everyone's voice is as unique as a fingerprint. There are no two voice patterns that are the same. It's, it's remarkable. And so I think that's why it, it seems like you're working when you watch it in a way. It seems mm -hmm. to me you, to view it requires the imaginative uh, participation in the sense of, of, of the people watching because there are no pictures, but it runs like a film. But what's interesting to me about that in relation to you I mean, uh, is the fact that you, you collect a lot of things. Yeah, I'm a collector. Right? Postcards. Oh, all sorts of things. Yes, but not so much. Did so did you take the pictures, a lot of pictures, and see that it was rough? No, I just collected the postcards. I do like to put things together in groups because that's how you learn about them. Well, that's how I learn about things. You have several different, let's see, if you were a foreigner, far from Mars, and you, you visited somebody, and you looked at all the cutlery, and you discovered a spoon, and then you went to someone else's house, and you discovered another spoon, and spoon, and spoon, and you looked at all these spoons, 
you would know something then about the possibilities of sameness and difference. Mm -hmm. And that has always interested me. And of course, a lot of the things that I collect follow this pattern of being things that are thought to be very trivial or unimportant or maybe slightly embarrassing or, you know, that sort of thing. But the collecting is, I know people who are more avid collectors than I, let's put it like that, because they are collectors and I'm not collectors. A collector in that sense, I mean, I do like to collect things, but they are materials for my work. Although I don't know that usually when I start the collection. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been so much written about collecting and archives and <coughs> so forth. And um, yeah. I suppose that leads me to the piece that's in the museum now, which I first saw, I think, I brought a friend of mine for her 50th birthday to your studio. I think it's that. And you were working on <coughs> I didn't, you know. Oh, you did, really? Did you see it then? Yes. Hmm. Yes, the packages. Do you know what's in the? You know what's in the packages. Well, I think maybe everybody doesn't know. Do you know? Have any of you actually seen? Have you all gone into the Freud um, study and seen <coughs> Susan's piece where the sound emanates? And well, so maybe you read the text and then you know what's in the text. Well, in fact, the first time I went, I didn't. You did. Except that I didn't read the text. It was only Dawn who said to me, could you read the text, please? And I thought, oh, she knows that I'm the kind of person that needs text as well. <laughs> and not just, you know, I'm not visually literate enough. <coughs> um, that started as a rescue project. I think I should I tell the story. Yes, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, I was driving with my husband. He was driving, actually. I was looking out the window. We were in the East End near Brook Lane Market. This was about seven years ago. And um, it was raining, and it was a you know, typical miserable day. And there was a sort of dip <laughs> on the side of the road, um, which is sort of a puddle. And I looked, and I saw this huge piece of blue cloth. Well, I had to go and see what it was, because I collect junk, you know. So I went, and I discovered it was a blue velvet curtain. And there were other things there, too. There were blue velvet things, and there were some smaller things, and there was an enormous book, a huge book. Big, like a Bible, bigger, you know, big book, like a ledger or a big old-fashioned Bible. So I hurriedly put them in the back of the car, and I took them to my studio, and I cleaned them and dried them and looked at them and examined them, and I saw what I had was some stuff from an old synagogue that had been thrown out. And you know the East End used to have a lot of these small shopfront synagogues. And they had small congregations, and obviously, um, when they were de what is it, deconsecrated as with the church, you know, they just move everything out. And the builders must have just found all this stuff, and they threw it out. They didn't know what to do with it. They had no particular interest for them. And they were things like um, the there was a, tor a Torah cover you know, blue velvet with a lion and a unicorn facing the mosaic symbol of the Ten Commandments. And there was uh, this blue velvet curtain, and there were several other things. And the book was particularly interesting because the book had been the ledger for the burial society. And as you know, in, in small churches and in synagogues and all these places, up until the late 20th century, people without much money used to contribute a little bit every week so that they would not be buried in a pauper's grave. It was very, very important. So this synagogue also had had this, this funeral society, and everybody's name had been written there in sort of Gothic letters, and there was a sort of page in the middle that someone had done a very beautiful sort of little painting of, a, I don't know, sort of trees and flowers and the Ten Commandments sort of thing. And I just thought these were in transit in a weird way. Um, in transit from 
having been in a context of meaning where they meant something, to a sort of unknown destination. And that made me think about, this is a train of thought, about immigrants of all kinds who take things with them, their most important things. And that made me think of how immigrants often end up having to sell their things in that push cart, which I found a few <coughs> days later also near Brick Lane. It's an old-fashioned wooden peddler's cart, really. And so I wrapped the parcels up and put them on the cart and decided that this was going to be like some other works of mine where people will not believe that the contents are what I say they are, even though I made labels explaining all of this on the labels. But people always say to me, oh, you could just have wrapped up anything. Well, why would it, where would be the fun of doing that? Where would be the interest in making fakes? I, I simply can't understand why anyone would think that would be a worthwhile way to spend your time. Anyway, <laughs> then I began to think about it a little more, and I realized that this little game of what's inside and invisible and what's outside and visible is actually, it has for me, anyway, more resonance than the idea of fakery. So this music, which is, of course, some of you will know, um, it is a, a, a Jewish cantor singing tiny little excerpts from a morning prayer. And that morning prayer is what people say when they wake up. This is what religious people do. And they thank God for having a soul. And I thought this whole idea of the soul it's invisible. It's a something inside us that's invisible. And people take it on faith. That's why that music is with those parcels. And it, its meaning changes, of course, in the Ford music. Yeah. Anyway, it's, 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 all, it's boring. And then I did red, and then I did red. Is anybody bored? <laughs> I don't think so. And I mean, I'm going to just ask you whether you've, I think you did that before the J Street. Yes, so, I did. Which uh, is the last time I think you talked in public. Very extraordinary. Uh, it's a film, and there's also a book, a series of photographs. Um, I'm going to get this wrong, but this is what stays with me. This is, this is you see, I'm, I'm your hunter, as opposed to the artist, right? So what stayed with me was, this extraordinary document, the documentation of streets in Germany called Judenberg, Judenstrasse. Um, yeah, that's fine. You know, just yeah. go on and on and on and on yeah. and on. And you photographed those what in the last decade. Yes, well, yeah, about seven, again, it's about seven or eight years ago, right. but I made the, the push card piece before I went to yeah. Germany. Well, and, and this I is a real, and, and what I said to, you know, series of related. And what I said to Susan at the time, that these images are so flat and upsetting and so banal, mm -hmm. and they're just accepted. And it's like, like the punch and juice. Like the, the ten months, like um, you, you force us to look at something that's right there in front of our eyes that we don't see. Well, again, the you know the anecdote that goes with that because I I am very um, what is the word of uh, I come across things you know I don't necessarily seek them out. And I'm willing to go with that if what I find has a paradox in it that I feel I have to get to the bottom of in some way. I need to know more about it. Because I was in Berlin on a, a residency and I was walking around. And you know how you have a, a map of a guidebook and you look up at the street to see where you are. And I saw this street and it said Unistrasse. And I thought, oh my goodness, what in the world does that mean? I mean, this is Germany after all, where they try to get rid of all the Jews. Why are they naming the street that? That is so peculiar. And I was absolutely haunted by it. Such a paradox. And also, of course, the street sign, you know, a sign in linguistics is something that points directly to another thing. And here it was, like sort of doubled, you know. So, you know, 
the next couple of days, I looked on the street directory of Berlin, and there are five other streets with Union in them. And then I went and did a bit of research, and I discovered that, and of course, before the war, there were probably five or six hundred of these streets. I only found three hundred because only three hundred. Well, as cities, as places change, you know, street names. I know, but that's so sort of extraordinary. Yes, number. it is. So what does it mean? I, I think we've got one means. in London. No. Yes, I found another one way up in. I'll tell you about it. There, are, there are several. We have um, in the city of London. We have what is it called? Jews, Jews Street. But there's there's another one which is called Jewish Street that I found very odd. They're not big streets, so they don't often get named. You know, they get listed in the news. Mm -hmm. um, every they were everywhere. But the the thing that this uncovered, in addition to the fact that the streets, those street names are very very old. And what happened when the Nazis came in was they changed lots of street names that they didn't like to Nazi names. Then after the war, when Germany was denazified, they put all the old street names back. So this is how all the J streets came back. But of course, they've been left there as a kind of unintentional monument or memorial, which to me is much more affecting than these Holocaust monuments they put up everywhere. Uh, it's, it shows where actual real people lived and had enough of a presence to have the street carry that name. And, um, well, I mean, there's a lot, a lot more to say about this, but <clears throat> that was an amazing experience for me, having the privilege of, of <clears throat> discovering them. And, of course, I deliberately made photographs of them as they are, you know, literally snapshots, because I didn't want to add melancholy or horror or whatever. There are too many books of photographs that tell you what you should think about things. And I just wanted to um, show them to people, really. And as a result, of course, there are several kind of discoveries that people make from looking at them, including me. Aside from the fact that they've been kept and that they're there as markers, they're are so many of them, and many of them are in the countryside or in tiny, tiny villages. And everybody, most people, have the idea that the Jews in Germany lived in towns. Well, no, they didn't. They were farmers, and they were blacksmiths, and they were bakers, and some of them lived in cities and were professionals, and so forth and so on. So this, in Germany, this has caused quite a surprise to people because Although people in Germany do learn their own history very well, this is a subject that they don't really go into the deep history of. Mm -hmm. And in fact, as it turns out, and I didn't know this either, the Jews were in Germany before the Germans were German. Mm -hmm. They came with the Romans. They were there that long. And they were that settled, and they were that integrated into German society. So there are things you can discover from just progressing through numerous examples of similar things. So, I'm going to open this up. Um, you want to finish, but I think other people probably want to talk to you a little bit. Can we give them a little space? Yeah, sure. If you want to stick your hand up if you want to, in the back. Can you stand up and shout? Because it's not such a great room. I can stand up. If I can shout. Um, I'm sorry to go back to the beginning of your conversation when you were talking about, I think, Susie, you said, am I the master of my own house? Um, who is doing this work? And it reminded me of uh, a book I'm reading about Picasso, who was very interested in Rambo's saying, apparently, which roughly in English is, I am the other. And Picasso apparently very much believed in that and thought that his the pictures were something that he did not fully have any kind of conscious control over, apparently, and that he would be quite surprised by what he produced after beginning a picture, you know, what would actually be produced at the end. I mean, obviously, not totally surprised, but that sense of you know, not being in kind of co total conscious control, which possibly enabled him to develop something as extraordinary as cubism, for example. And 
having that ability to sense that there's another or an other, a real other in me that's not me. You can respond well, that. that's, that's very interesting. I, <coughs> I guess I myself think that um, the, two, the, two, the two beings or whatever, the two selves come together in, um, in work that works. Because when you're working on any visual project, in a sense you're also the viewer the project, you know, the outside person who's looking at what's happening. And there's a, le <coughs> a level of judgment that enters into it so that you know whether it's good or not. And I think there are artists who work totally from the unconscious or, or think that they do. And I'm not one of them, honestly. But I learned a huge amount from that automatic writing experience. And after that, I was able to do it any time I wanted to. I could just switch into that mode. But I stopped doing it because the handwriting became so elegant, so practiced, so to speak, that it seemed to me to be, be losing its value for me. But isn't, I mean, I suppose modern psychoanalysis would say, yes. um, instead of going on about um, the un instead of about the unconscious, the unconscious as a place that's fixed. I think it would be much more interested in talking about separate self-states or self-states that you kind of move in and out of, that you may, you may find yourself in them or not know that you're in them and then you're in them. And that there's a surrender, in a, a psychotherapy or in a psychoanalysis, there's a surrender to the, to the, to the, to those self state or they come and that at the same time which I think is a parallel with you saying you're the viewer of the work is there's a third that the therapeutic couple makes up a third which looks and which can can break the merger but also can see the process of, of what's happening while it's going on. Does that make any sense? Yes it does and, and before when you were saying that um, these um, states of these communicated states that you have no good language for. And you were saying, <coughs> of course, I don't do that the rest of the time. You know, I just do it. Um, it's, it's, it happens in the psychoanalytic situation. Well, I guess that implies that you have control over it. Was it? Yeah, right. Well, I do now over the automatic writing, handwriting. But I didn't at the beginning. It just took me completely by surprise. It just, whoosh, this happened. And I was utterly perplexed by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It was also boring, I have to say. I, I wrote about this afterwards. I said, after a while, it became boring to watch my dad writing what, in fact, was very repetitive uh, stuff. You know, interesting, but it did repeat itself over and over again. Anybody else like to come in? <laughs> I mean, I suppose the question is that those, those, those states are certainly there. It's just that in my line of work, I don't look at them unless I'm looking at them. But if they're things you feel or perceive in some way, how do you account for that? In daily life or in the clinic? Well, sometimes in daily life, don't you have intuitive feelings about people? Or? Well, I think you get a response. You get a response, right? And then the job is, well, what kind of a response is this, right? You know, why do I feel warmly or nervous towards this audience or negative here or all of those things are well, because there's a lot more going on than we can talk about. I mean, is that an extension or is it completely different from the kind of thing that I think all of us would say like, that man made me so angry, I don't know why, or I really liked so and so when I no, first met No, of course it's an extension. It's the same. Of course it's the same yeah. phenomenon. Mm. But the, the difference in the therapy, or the difference for the artist, or the difference 
for those of us uh, artists of different natures, I'm not, you know, is that you you enter into it, you surrender to it in order to lose it in some way. And what about followers? And you were interrogated. I'm thinking yeah. about a writer. Yeah. I mean, and I'm a writer in the own right too. So, I mean, you don't take your first thought because it, it may not be sufficiently complex, authentic, truthful. Uh, it's too, it's, it's, right? It's, you have to ask yourself something a bit more about it. Is that really it? I was thinking of novels, for yes. example, the kind of novels who say things, which I'm sure is true for them, that but the characters, once we had their names, they just took off and they had a life of their own. And I just could hardly keep up with them when I was writing. And this kind of thing, which always struck me as fabulously interesting. But even when I made, a, I, I made a book of imaginary stories, imaginary patients, because I didn't know how to write about people without disclosing um, confidentiality. I thought, well, I'll just make them up. And, you know, I'll, I'll base the therapist on, on a very nice version of myself. <laughs> Deeply empathic and intelligent and everything. Um, and it was exactly that. It was like these people lived for me. I'd never met them before, and now I was living with them. Yeah. And all of a sudden, one of them takes out a knife in the middle of the session. Never happened. You know, why? How come? Well, how come? Exactly. So <laughs> something has been distilled you know, human, in human experience in me, which then found a rendition in something that was in a different form. Yeah. And it's very exciting. And I, that's why I suppose I feel that, that you know, psychoanalysis and, and art, whether it's writing or making object, object or trying to do art is a very similar practice. But what well, psychoanalysis has, has an aesthetic to it as well as an understanding of these things you can't and you can, that you live between the can and the can't on the border of understanding and transforming. Mm. You don't agree with that? No, 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 it's not that I agree with it. I wish it were spoken about that more often, only because I myself have an obsession about discovering uh, you know, the boundaries of people and things, and that interests me because I know that when I pick up this cup, the only reason that that works is because the molecules in the cup and the molecules in my thumb are colliding with each other. Now, if I could just touch the cup and it dissolved, I would have a different theory, you know, about being. And there are certain people who can do things like that, and there are certain people who's Telepathic ability, if you like, I know you don't like that word, no, 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 is I'll take it, it goes, no. goes beyond something like the transfer situation. And there are people who could look at maps and locate lost objects and something like that. I'm interested in these things. And I think that the psychoanalytic situation, if it does produce and clearly does these really close communions between people. Is important, but I don't think it's described that way to the. I don't think it is because I think it you know, used to be a, a very paternalistic and rather authoritarian practice with the because of when it came into being and because it was dealing with that thing called mm -hmm. sex and neurotic, you know, it was the doctor knows. And, that, and I think we've learned a lot about well, the doctor doesn't actually know unless the doctor is available to observe. So it's been, I think it's been democratized, which isn't to say that the therapist gives up their authority in any sense, but they give up the, the, the being the only knowing one who is actually giving the interpretation. And there's something rather different happens in, in the therapy relationship, I think, as a result. And so that's why I think modern psychotherapeutic writing is, is much more interesting. And, and it's very funny to me, and I've probably said this here before, is that people in other disciplines like anthropology take the writing of psychoanalysis from 100 years ago and use it, and I don't know what they're on about, because to me it's kind of not... It's, it's not live for me. But this is what happens, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, people who write arts theory are usually writing about artists from the 50s and 60s. They love abstract painting because you can say anything. 
about. <laughs> um, I mean, no, seriously, you know, I mean, that people can't have an expertise in everything. In, in everything. Yeah. And um, that, that doesn't surprise me. But what, <coughs> what does surprise me is that since Freud, and I think Forenzi, and a couple of other people, there have been, there's been nothing that addresses the, the rather archaic concepts that seem to prevail when people are thinking. I mean, I have to use these words, like to or whatever. Okay, well, I think it's, it's in the somatic countertransference. Okay. No, but seriously, is it? People need to, um, well, I to, think, know, to be able to explore okay, many more okay, things. Okay, but I think there's a category. You see, psychoanalysis sets itself up as being anti-healing, right? If you went there to get help, there was something wrong with you. Right? That, there was, and I think, so there are people who wanted to help who became healers rather than therapists and psychoanalysts. And it might be in that domain that you do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to come in? Yes, please. Um, no, I'd just like to say something about um, the material nature of the world. Um, because I, I, I think that every book was the old season has is has been conceived that it can be different and he invented way a ways of saying things or showing things. But which is where the real pleasure of the work resides, I think. And, and the wit, I think. Because sometimes to um, because of that curious way you had of looking at it. I mean, for example, with the James Group, the material basis for that is all the trips you made around the Germany, um, going down obscure streets and obscure parts of Germany, with a passion to fill it. These men would not appear to be able to do that. And so, as an artist, I mean, that's when you always said the artist is a the first order. That's that is what the ideas involved are there as well. But the ideas for me the ideas don't come first. I'm so glad you mentioned that the ideas do not come first. That's why I've often said I'm a material space practice. I try to do something as an end result that derives from the materials and not, you know, not add to them or take away from them, but just to present them in a certain way that I hope opens up the kinds of things that I'm thinking about then, you know. And in terms of the J Street project, I mean, it could have been done by any social historian, couldn't it? But no, it never occurred but to it them. Wasn't. No. <laughs> Hi oh, there. Um, just ask the question to go back to the automatic writing a second. Um, yeah. You talked about the process, and you're super quite interested in the process of it, but what was the content? Was that interesting? Oh, well, the content was a message about three sisters who lived in the air and on the water, and they were my sister, and I was a sister of everyone. It went on and on like this, and the sisters of Menon, and of course, Menon is a the king in ancient Egypt, which perhaps I knew about, perhaps I didn't. Um, at the time, because of this, the location was in France, and I was in Cathar country, and I thought it had something to do with them. Uh, but I had no idea. Because at a certain point, <coughs> I'm getting very upset. The, um, <laughs> the text that I was writing said something like, come to the, and then there was a very crude, circle with the cross in the middle, come to the, and it looked like a church, and then I found out later that that was the Cathar symbol for, they didn't use the Catholic cross, they used that, so. You know, you, you can do automatic writing, should you be interested. It has been used by some psychoanalysts, uh, something called Anita Mule did very interesting work in the 50s and 60s with a number of her um, patients. And what, what she said to people to do, well, she said it's about breaking habits. So you 
with your right hand as you write with your left hand. And if your left hand you write with your right hand. Is that for me? Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, it's particularly helpful <coughs> if you can oh, further distract your normal, thank you very much, your normal attention by doing something like watching TV at the same time. So you sit yourself in front of the television set and you have paper and pencil and so forth, and you use the other hand, and you just let your hand move, that's all. It may not do anything, but it may, you never know. And that's the way Gertrude Stein, Gertrude Stein did her MA and BA thesis, version on that, the only published, she denied it in later life. <laughs> <laughs> but the theses were published, so, you know, they're available. And that's what she did with groups of, you know, she tested lots of um, other students to see what they would come up with. But, you know, Tony, when you lay it out that way, I, I think about the dream. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're just taking a couple more questions, comments in the back again. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested in um, the, the distance between kind of belief and interest in your work, especially as you're dealing with the supernatural. <laughs> And I'm thinking about a contact where you know you had all the people talking Can about. You say it, speak a bit louder. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just I'm just interested in like the the distance between belief in your subject matter and just an interest because I'm just thinking about pieces like where you presented recordings of the dead um, and also people that had seen UFOs. Um, as an artist, are you kind of just showing an interest, or are you actually making statements that you yourself believe that this phenomenon could exist? I don't believe in anything. So therefore, I don't believe that these things are not true. Any more than I believe that they're not true. You see what I'm saying? I think there's a place between the subjective and the dualism. The dualism that our culture encourages us to abide by. I want to be able to be in another space where I'm not um, an advocate of either side of that debate. Well, you are and you aren't, right? Because by the very fact that your brain is so full, you the same see, observe. So I, th I think that's, I think that's just slightly disingenuous. Oh, I have <laughs> I position my work in a tradition of modern art in which many of the greatest practitioners were also doing the same thing. So maybe there's a very close connection between art practice and something else that is between the rational and the irrational, if you like. I don't know how else to describe it as dualism again. You're looking in trouble. No, I'm thinking those liminal spaces, yes. whatever they are. Yes. Right, isn't that what that word's for? Yeah. But obviously I have a liking in some way for these particular materials. I mean, you'll notice I never deal with Satanism or <coughs> demons and I'm not into that at all. Um, yeah. Does that answer it at all? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> kind of. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you could say a bit more about the idea not coming first and what does come first and at what point the idea of yeah. coming in. Um, that's a very difficult, isn't that a very difficult question? I mm -hmm. think, um, let's say you're doing a painting. You have to start somewhere, so you have the paper, you have the paintbrush or pencil, something, you know, something in your head, like it's a landscape, or maybe it's going to be abstract. But that isn't what, what comes first is the mark or the, the touch or something. So in, in the same way, I start with, I think this is how I work, I start with materials and then I look at them for a long time and I try to figure out why these materials, why am I looking at these materials, why do they interest me, what, what are they, you know, and what can I do with them, well, I can move them around, I can do this, I can, you know, it's just, 
And through doing that, I learned a lot about them, the, these things. You know, just like every time you make a painting, we learn more about painting. We learn more about the materials of painting. And of course, you learn other things too. You learn what a good painting is and what a not good painting is, and so forth and so on. But that's how I start. And that I never had an abstract idea. Afterwards, I can tell you what I think the ideas are, but I can't tell you in the first place. At the moment, I'm working on a small new video thing, and I can tell you what the components are, but I have no idea what the work is like because I haven't got it done yet. I haven't put them together yet. I don't know. So it's always a process of trying to find out something. That's, can I just take that bit further? I'm just thinking that you're saying you start with the materials and then it, mm. you work with the materials and they, it develops from there. But what makes you choose the particular materials? Oh, well, this is something that, yeah, I don't have a formula. I, I come across something that for some reason triggers something. Usually, I'm attracted and repulsed at the same time. I with things, or like with the ores and other things that you talk about, I, I can see that it would be great to believe in this, and at the other, other hand, I don't believe in it, and I know they're made by aura cameras, and you know, there's a special I, I have to put all that together, somehow. So they often are things that I'm really attracted to, but at the same time, I'm not attracted to. <laughs> I try to work with that. <coughs> as, you start, as you start collecting something, whether it's the sort of the analogy of the photographs that were gay street, it takes on a kind of momentum yeah. and it becomes something else. Yeah, that's and I think right. that's what exactly. always fascinates me. Exactly. You create this kind of that's work right. as all the various collections. That's what I was saying about spoon. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 I think that's absolutely right. And because you've gone down that route, and you've gone down that route, and therefore you have yeah. something to play with. Yes, and it's physical to a large extent too, and that's why I think I'm making fewer and fewer um, video type works now because they're not, it's not very physical, you know, you do have to plan them in a different way and so forth. And as I get older, I, I enjoy more and more the physicality of doing, doing things that are physical. And I include, you know, drawing and painting as physical kind of practices. Maybe just very quickly because I think. Go ahead. No, I, was just, I was just going to say that hearing you talk about that process, it strikes me there's a lot in common between both of your processes, which is that, that you're both involved in putting together material that you discover, mm. and that there's a kind of, I wonder whether you ever think of your own practice as a kind of process, of, which is quite... <laughs> There's a lot in common with the psychoanalytic process of mm -hmm. interrogating your choices, interrogating your material, asking questions yeah, about your own motivations, mm -hmm. and both being involved in this sort of investigative process mm -hmm. where you have all these bits and pieces that you then try to make sense of and piece together to form something. That's a, that's a really interesting thing to say. I mean, I, I always like to think that art is a, you know, is a necessity. It wouldn't exist unless we needed it. Why else would it, you know? And it seems to me that art, for viewers, and I include myself as a viewer, because I often say I wouldn't have to make this work except I need to see it, you know? Um, and other people's work, too. It interrogates me when I look at it or listen to it. But that's really interesting in relation to the therapist role. You know? Right, because it's not that they're fragments. There's something said, and then there's a big silence, there's, and there's a lot of words, and there's nothing. Right, it's, and you've got to, you've got to do something with that. Which is yes. yes. But one last observation. I was just going to make a comment that uh, a parallel between your work, maybe a free association, that's a bit similar to the other comment. It's this, this kind of same process where one thing leads to another, maybe leading to the self, that's maybe underlying, uh, lying under many layers somewhere. And also that I, I personally have a belief that art 
It's, it's like a materialization of my internal world. So you make it visible, that's right. something that's internal and invisible. And um, by doing that, you, you are touching the world in a different level. It, like it, there is a space between your internal world and the outside world. By creating the art, maybe you make a bridge. A bridge. Well, I think that's interesting too, because I think that what artists do is they take internalizations that are shared, because after all, we're all in the same boat together, you know, and they, they find a form for it. So then people can talk about something that they couldn't before, and that's why I always said artists of first order practice, and artists should not be illustrated or work of theorists, so they just do their own work, because that work is also a contribution to what you might call knowledge or self-knowledge or something. And um, yeah, I agree. But I don't know about the free association. Yeah, I think that's, well, if that goes back to the more old-fashioned idea, it doesn't it? It's like analysis in a way, as opposed to the collect the building, and you go this route, and then you go this route, and you go this route. But I think maybe those things operate together. I think we should stop. I think we should thank Susan. Thank you, Susan. For